Thank you all for checking out this week's episode. Once again, I'm John. If you liked what you heard and saw today, subscribe to our YouTube channel. Find us on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. And check out our brand new merch store with hats, coffee mugs, t-shirts, other cool stuff coming down the pipeline. Again, thank you all for support. Be safe and see you next week. How's it going, everyone? John here, the host of Spirit Talk. And today we get to welcome the incredible Marshall Bell to the show. Marshall is an Army veteran, actor, consultant, uh, one of my favorite character act- actors in the industry. Uh, you know him from roles in uh, Friday, or Nightmare on Elm Street Part 2, Friday's Revenge, Total Recall, uh, Starship Troopers, Twins, Stand By Me, uh, numerous appearances on shows like X-Files, Tales from the Crypt, uh, Hill Street Blues. It's list goes on. Uh, Marshall, it's great to have you on here. It's great to be here, and you're a good guy for asking me. Uh, so I'm like, I'm like, you start on that. Like, I know we're talking before we record here. Uh, but the reason why I want to reach out to you is growing up as a kid, uh, there's certain actors, um, from television shows and movies where I've always resonated with where it's like, man, that person's portraying a character I want to do, or whether it's fighting aliens or, uh, serving in a military camp or doing all this crazy stuff. And I had the luxury last year to finally interview William Sanderson, who, like you, is one of my favorite character Bless actors. Bless his heart. Bless his heart. And with our talk, we talked about what it takes to become a character actor. If someone like you, Marshall, to be so prolific in what you do, it's such a, like, I'm going to say, old, when you were so much older in your 40s, when you jump into the real world of acting and TV, it's like, before we even get to that point, the quest to get to that level where, you finally you meet your wife now that helped you get in there, this famous Academy Award winning uh, costume designer. But those moments that lead up to there, what was it like before you got that first call to jump into filming? Boy, you know an awful lot. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, so, um, you know, I, uh, I, the, here, let, let me start. Uh, I, I did act. Uh, and I realized how much, how important that was to me. Uh, I went to a little school in Colorado Springs. When I was 16, I'd been kicked out of another school. These are boarding schools. And, um, you know, I was a bad attitude kind of guy, but I went and I decided to read for the school play. And the school play was Harvey and they had some uh, very, very able actor who was going to end up going to Harvard and all that stuff. And of course, he was obviously going to get the lead and everything. And then I, I got the lead as this bad attitude, freshly kicked out of school guy in the in, in this play. And I played, I played this part uh, of Elwood Dowd, which was in Harvey, which was a uh, which was the part of a, a of actually it was written by people in Alcoholics Anonymous for the sake of other people about a guy who hallucinated that his best friend was a rabbit. And it became famous. Jimmy Stewart was in it and everything. So we put it on and and the Colorado Springs paper saw it and and said it was great. And then we went in and we actually put it on in front of, in a a huge venue where it had about 800 seats. And I had no idea what all that meant in those days. That's a, today if I had to perform in front of 800 seats, it would freak me out. (laughs) And so uh, I, it it imbued some kind of confidence in me that boom segue to i was running around europe uh my half brother lived in ireland and i met my wife milena while she was working on a film called barry linden and we got together and uh and uh she was working on a film called cotton club and I was a consultant at that time. You're right. You have that right. Uh, I was teaching uh, senior executives how to improve their communication skills. You know, they have to give a lot of presentations and all that kind of thing. And I was sitting back there. I just come back and she had a table where a lot of these potentates from Ca- uh, Cotton Club, including Francis Coppola, who she's working for oh, at this very yeah. minute. She, she just she just arrived. It was a tiny little humble dinner, but, you know, they all came over <clears throat> and uh, uh, uh he, I hope I'm not taking, I have to tell you this, but uh, so she, she's now what goes around, comes around. She's working for him in Atlanta. She just arrived last night on the plane in Atlanta. Awesome. And, uh, she's working on this megalopolis movie for Francis again. It gets me a little emotional because, because of cotton club, we've been in their lives and they, you know, right. I've worked for all five Coppola's I've worked crazy. For, 
for Francis, Eleanor, the wife, uh, Sophia, the daughter, Roman, the son, and the granddaughter. It's awesome. I don't know if any other actor can say that. So anyway, so his casting director was there at this dinner, and his name's Fred Roos, and to this day, he's one of my best friends now. And uh, he, uh, uh, Alan Parker, who me, my wife had worked with on Midnight Express, says, uh, I'm looking for somebody to play this role in this movie, Birdie. And Fred, and, and he was using somebody else named Juliet Taylor, a famous casting director from New York City. But he was just asking Fred for side advice. And Fred said, uh, well, what are you looking for? He said, well, I'm looking for somebody that remind you know, I'm looking for somebody like Marshall. Because he knew me from, you know. And uh, Fred said, why don't you just use Marshall? True story. Awesome. And he did. I mean, I had to actually audition for it. And I worked very hard to do that. <clears throat> and I got that little role in a movie called Birdie. And, uh, uh, for, you know, Fred's my, Fred and I are very close friends to this day. Uh, and, and I always say to people to make myself sound cool, what do uh, Marshall Bell, Sean Penn, Tom Cruise, uh, Nicolas Cage, Angelica Houston, and Jack Nicholson have in common? And the answer is Fred Roos. And awesome. uh, so, so you know, I get to say that. <laughs> so that's how that happened. And then I did Birdie, and I had a little tricky <clears throat> thing I did in the scene, which was to spit on a typewriter. Hollywood loves all that kind of tricky stuff, you know. So I got, I started getting auditions, and I got Nicolas Cage's agent, and I was, I stayed with her for thirty some years. That's awesome. I was forty three. Yeah, you're right. I was older, but. Uh, but my sense memory mem remembered what it was like all the way back to when I was 16, the, the, the pressure of performing in front of people. When you got your degree in the sociology department or you're building towards that, and when it became to teaching high level executives to public speak, was that your, like, what was your main goal when you got your degree in sociology that you're going to be that type of consultant coach? Or is there another aspect of that, well, that you kind of wanted to do? I actually wanted to go to work for a thing like the Bureau of Indian Affairs or, or um, uh, you know, get into uh, something pertaining to civil rights back then. That was, you know, the right. six, it was sixties and yeah. my deal was, my deal was civil rights basically. And uh, uh, I was in a, uh, I actually was in a, an organization called CORE, wh which was one of those like NAACP. Gotcha. And, uh, they kind of changed directions later on. Uh, and, uh, uh, and then I, uh, but I had to make a living. So I went into the oil field and, uh, it's quite a jump from civil rights. <laughs> trust me, <laughs> big, huge, huge jump. And, uh, but anyway, that, what that taught me flexibility, which actors have to have. I mean, I had to behave myself and, and, uh, and then my father died, which, and I had had a little luck in the uh, uh, side thing in the oil field, uh, slightly shady, which I'm not going to get into. But anyway, I, I had a little <laughs> dough. So I kind of said, you know, I'm sick of all of this. I'm sick of the 60s. I'm sad my father died. And I just took off for Europe. And, uh, and I really stayed there for the next 10 years, which is how sort of I met my wife in Ireland right. visiting my brother. Uh, and I wasn't. Uh, and then, uh, in 1980 is I, you could have said I was a bum. I mean, I did a little of this and a little of that, of course, antiques con containers and things like that. But then I, um, I got hired, uh, because of kind of old boy network stuff to be a consultant and you had to learn a technique and you had to get it across to some of these senior executives. So I was able to do that. And I did that. It's awesome. And, and, you know, I did it until 1984, and, and then it's when I got asked to do Birdie. It's fascinating when you – I've had the privilege to kind of see, be the outside looking in, when they, they bring in people like yourself, these consultants, to kind of teach high-level people how to talk and how to deal with people and micromanage and all that stuff. It's always fascinating when people at that level, they don't really know how to public speak. And it's like you always – I'm always looking at it like it's, it's very like how would you get that far without – being able to talk in front of people where you have people's attention and how to maintain focus and all that stuff. It's just a, I couldn't imagine 
teaching someone how to open their mouth and talk. It's it's something fascinating to me. They had enormous powers, how and and they had something to get them where they got. Uh, uh, the thing that made it uh, why I was able to do it, I think, is because I, you know, I I'd been around. I mean, I knew I'd been I'd met Stanley Kubrick, and right. and so I'm meeting the chairman of Morgan's Bank. It's cool. He's big, and I mean, he's in his own way maybe as big as Stanley Kubrick. But the thing is, you're not, you can't, you're not intimidated by them. And you right. just say, you have to get them to trust you that you've got something to show you and they're clever. And if it's working for them, then they appreciate it. What led you to jump into the U S army? Oh, that's easy. Uh, I was at Yale university for a while. And, uh, I, uh, I fell in love for the first time and she dumped me and I just said, nothing matters. I don't want to rule the world. I don't want to be here. And uh, I dropped out and that was what we did in those days. You got drafted and I joined rather than wait around to get drafted right. because I thought I could choose what I wanted to do. If I joined, turns out they took that away from me because I, I didn't have a security clearance because I had misbehaved a little yep. bit drunk stuff, you know? Yep. Uh, and uh, 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 so they made me an army medic, which I'm very uh, eternally grateful for. I That's, mean, I, I actually had a functional job, which I did things in. It's crazy, too, because it's like when you look at your body of work in terms of like the actual filming and TVs, and movies, some of your best characters are the military, military brass people. people, whether it's Starship Troopers, I thought was just just in such a great role. Again, well, with Michael, yeah. My military career went like this. I, I got out of the Army as what's called an E-4, Spec 4. The next job I had was Birdie, was E-6. The next one was a, I was a Sergeant First Class, which was E-7. Then I played a Sergeant Major. Then I played a real Major. Then I played a Lieutenant Colonel. Then I played, and, and I got promoted all the way up to General <laughs> Owen, who was uh, a four-star general in Starship Troopers. And then I got eaten by, uh, smashed by a grasshopper. It's... Uh... <clears throat> When it comes to the when it, people that a lot of times like, well, I've had other actors out here that served in the military and stuff like that, and you you hear when you hear someone like an actor like Adam Driver talk about his Marine Corps service and how it's that part of training your life, even though if you have three years to ten years of career before you get to the movies, do you ever sit back when you're like a, a cast area or filming and stuff and people are bitching or complaining about little things where it's like, man, I did this where I was like I was a medic. There's someone who's hurt or someone. It's like does it put stuff in perspective for you? With that background you have in the military, uh, uh, I mean, it's it, what I always say about my military experience is, uh, if it were, you know, when I hear that people got out of it, I'm not mad because uh, if I had my choice uh, to not have to, uh, it's one of those things where you wouldn't have done it if you didn't have to do it. But I'm really glad I did it. Right. No, I'm it's... glad they made me do it. It was. It's... I mean, it, the, the amount of the the uh, perspective it gave you was that it made us you know i was from a certain background and then you're thrust into this situation and you got people from south central and you're all <laughs> you're all together and you're all sharing the same interests and you got each other's back it was it, it was invaluable right. what i learned in there about how to various kinds of people and things so of course it would have helped with acting yeah it's uh the first time i remember the first time i saw you on screen uh vhs i went to the rental store and my parents let me pick out a couple of movies and oddly enough and this is a true story twins and total recall were some of the first two movies i rented and the connection there is i'm i mean this is when i'm god nine or ten years old and uh I'm watching this stuff. It's like I'm not comprehending that the same actors outside of Arnold is in this. But as you get older, you start to appreciate this, these these men and women that steal scenes. Every whether it's a TV show or a movie, these character actors. At what point did you realize in your career that man, I'm really good at this, or not the the conceited way, but man, I'm a really good character actor that can really like really push these movies and shows to the next level. Twins. You know, that director was, and he's dead now. Yep. And uh, I uh, I loved him dearly. And uh, I actually worked for him three times. 
in legal eagles and and then i did uh, uh six days and seven nights which i got cut out of but i was told i would be at the very beginning because i had to set up another shot that had some kind of link and, and they just took me to hawaii and let me hang out there for a week they paid me a fair amount of money and so i knew what that was all about plus Ivan and all of them, they were on this boat and it was just jumping around on the waves. And I was the only one that didn't get seasick and they hated me for that. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, in twins, he, he could have had, uh, you name it, play oh, that role that he yeah, gave Webster. We're talking about. Yeah. yeah. And he, he, so I, I mean, I, I look back on that. I don't think I understood how great it was at the time, but he took me and he lit, he pretty much, um, I mean, he let me do what I thought was 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 Webster. And now that I'm watching Blacklist, I'm wondering huh, how much <laughs> how many times did Spader watch Webster? <laughs> anyway, so so uh, uh, so so he let me do that, and and even up to the point where there were a couple of technical things that I because I was still kind of a rookie that I didn't do. He got really annoyed with me one time when I was supposed to shut the suitcase with my foot. And uh, Arnold did it for me, and the finally we got out of there. But I, Ivan was furious, but he just turned me loose. And uh, I look back on that; that's huge that he did that, huge. And he did it because he thought uh, I was able to hold that character on, uh, on my own. And so that's quite a confidence builder. Yeah, that character is so unique because it's so cold and calculated. Yet there's a sense of he, not only did you look menacing, but like you had no problem killing or just accomplishing the mission, no matter what means necessary. And it was interesting seeing that type of character in a world with Dave DeVito and Arnold and this, this crazy idea is not even remotely po like it's possible, but it's too crazy. And here you are in the middle of it. It's just in that last 30 minutes, it's just a great role for you. Yeah, it was, that was a turnaround role for me. Definitely. And I'm eternally grateful to Ivan Reitman for, letting me do it it's beyond you know well you kind of hinted at that when you have a director or producer or someone in your circle that's working with you that gives you that has the trust and faith in you to do what you do best or put you in a position to succeed or really shine like it must it's again it must be a sense of not only a confidence boost but a sense of like uh kind of sit back and let me do my thing like there's gotta be something it's just awesome when that happens uh yeah that's yes <laughs> yeah i just was on a movie uh a little movie back east um, about a werewolf, and uh, <laughs> it, awesome. it's called Blacklist by uh, a, a guy who gets one of these movies made after another, uh, uh, named uh, uh, Larry Fessenden. And uh, God, he had such a great crew and everything. And uh, I had to memorize a lot of lines. <clears throat> and uh, you know, I'm not a spring chicken. I'm an old guy. So I go over there and I'm supposed to beat this guy up and call him a loser and chase him around with guns and all this kind of stuff. And, uh, you know, they just, yeah, I mean, you were hitting, it's because over the years, but you were hitting the nail on the head and then they leave you alone. The biggest thing they can do is they just come back and they reset the camera and everything. They don't say one word to you. And then you feel good about that. Awesome. So when you jump from Twins, and then obviously one of the other big roles you do in your career is Total Recall, uh, is George and Cotro. But when you work with Arnold again, when you jump into Total Recall and you film that great scene where it unveils that actually you are holding the actual Quattro on you, do you, that whole, the filming that scene, I do want to talk about because it is so iconic. And for me, the first time I saw it, I'm like, this is just shocking. That one did I know you voiced, I realized you voiced the actual Quattro, the guy, was that something where, like, how did that come to be? Where like Paul, the director, was just kind of like, "Hey, we'll just have we'll have we'll have Marshall voice this guy." Like, it well, no, I had to audition for that. When I wow. went down. I mean, he was looking at other people, and I think he, in the back of his head, thought it would be nicer to have me do it, probably. Right. Uh, but the fact that I was able to do it uh, 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 fitted into Paul's. Uh, you know, it was easier anyway. And, uh, but I went down and actually kind of, a kind of auditioned for it. The prosthetics, the makeup, the, this is a lot of times before the big CGI stuff started happening. It's like, it's so like game still to this day, it looks amazing. And yeah, Rob Botine. And so, 
Was he with the for the thing too? Right, he worked with John Carpenter. Yeah, I mean, he yeah. Did, I've worked with him later on some Joe Pitka commercials too. Oh, nice! It's it's crazy. Like when you have to when you get the script for that, was it always from the beginning that George, your character, was going to have Quattro on his chest? Yeah, you know, I'm so bad. You, <laughs> you know, when you uh, read the script and you, these are just a few lines. What am I? You know, and I go, you don't really your head doesn't understand when you go into this that you're going to be in the, I would have done it, but you're going to be in the makeup chair for nine hours while they glue that stuff on you on the first day and that you're not going to sleep for a whole week. That, that doesn't occur to you. That was hard. I mean, hard is, uh, you know, being an illegal working in a kitchen and not knowing where your next paycheck is going to come from. That's right. hard. Right. Right. But, from the standpoint of what I was, I right. was used to. That was a MF man. That was rough. Well, you hear about all these actors. I uh, know just Dave, not getting to sleep. Right. For a week. That was rough. It's That's like, hard. You heard like Dave Batista, the Guardians of the Galaxy movies. He has put this crazy makeup on. He goes. He just said an interview a couple of years ago. After the third movie, I'm done because I can't eat. I can't sleep. My life is dictated because I have to wear all these prosthetics, and makeup. It's, it is. Uh, but I guess I think what adds to that is. The people, people like yourselves, are willing to do that to really sell this role. Like it only, it only makes that film or whatever production you're on that much better. I think it's a testament to. What do you ever find that? Do you wish they made more movies like Total Recall today, or could you make a movie like Total Recall today, or or Starship Troopers, where it's well, you know, I was in a, I was in a movie called The Vagrant. Do you know that movie at all? I was uh, in a movie with that movie. Bill Paxton, right? Bill Paxton, yes. And that was a lot of makeup. And uh, I have an ambition to make that movie again, but I ain't going to be, I'm going to be a hologram. I ain't going to be the vagrant. <laughs> I'm going to get a younger vagrant. Right. What a great <laughs> I movie. Bill, I want Bill Paxton's young uh, son to be in it. Yep. So, yeah. Would you? I'll be in it. I mean, I'll be some extra spirit, hor more horrible than ever, but I won't be, I ain't being the vagrant. No, for sure. Would you get to work alongside Arnold again? Uh, do you guys have any... Was it when an actor like that walks in, you guys see each other again in catering and craft services, wherever. Do you ever have like a moment where you're like, hey, they see you, how you doing? Like, do you ever reminisce oh, yeah. when you see them about oh, old no, roles Arnold together? was kind of, um, I mean, you know, in this business, it's usually out of sight, out of mind. I mean, like, I've worked a lot of times with this actor, Donald Sutherland. Oh, yeah. We don't, I love him like a like an older brother, really. And, and I never see him, I never talk to him. But when we're on a movie, it's like, boom. <laughs> You know, that's how that works. And if I saw Arnold, I mean, he's even been governor and everything. <clears throat> it would be like, hey, man, how are you? You know, it, it, we're friends. Yeah. I mean, I, uh, I've i got tremendous respect for him as a performer anyway. Uh, you know, it was so easy to underrate his actual acting skills, for that matter, just because he was Arnold and everything. The fact of the matter is he was really great. Yep. And it was a good, he was a good guy, generous is it, guy. Is it easier for you to play a redeemable good guy character or is it easier or maybe even more fun to play something like Coach Snyder in uh, Nightmare on Elm Street 2 where you play this vile coach? It's like, in all the roles you've had, it seems like you're having fun, but is there a specific genre of character where you, that you kind of like, man, this is going to be real fun? You know, I like I, I like all of it. I haven't had a role that I didn't, you know, I haven't had a role I didn't like. I, I, I like it all. It's fun to do all that. Uh, you know, I had a, um, I was in a movie called uh, Nancy Drew with Emma Roberts. And I was really kind of obscure in it, except I was a creepy guy. I mean, really creepy. And then <laughs> turns out I'm the one who saves the day. And that was a kind of a nice thing to be able to do, actually. Right. Yeah. When it comes to getting ready for a movie or a TV show appearance, does your type type of preparation change for that? Or is it the same type of mindset? A job is a job. Same. Uh, what I try to do, if you want to know about preparation, what I try to do is uh, get the words as soon as possible and learn them. And uh, I worked on a series called deadwood oh yeah and that classic was, that was i know but i mean 
and, and those words, I wanted to know them, you know, and I, sometimes you'd get them like that night. And uh, I, I would, I wanted to get, you know, we got it all worked out and it was fun. And I'm actually proud of my work in Deadwood, but <laughs> it, it was, uh, <laughs> I like to get it a little earlier than that. I like to learn them as fast as I can so that they're in my head when I show up. It really helped when I did this little werewolf movie. God almighty, it helped. Oh, it's you know, you're always worried that you're never going to that your mind's going to go gaga this time. Right. Well, it's like your work ethic right now is just as prolific, if not more so than you were when you came the, when you're in the 40s. It's like, how do you maintain that drive? I mean, obviously, there's a passion there. You love what you do. and It's your career. Oh, I have fun doing it. Right. So that's the key, right? Have fun doing what you love. Yeah. You know, I <clears throat> I started doing commercials about 20 years ago. And. uh if you look, you know, commercials aren't about, uh, oh gosh, I'm doing commercials now because my, uh, other careers in the toilet. Right. Uh, that's not the kind of commercials I do. I've worked for some of the most talented storytellers, Joe Pitka for many, many times, yeah. uh, 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 you know, who, who's able to tell a, a 30 to one minute story. Uh, that's, that's a whoa, you know, and I've worked with Charles Barkley for crying out loud funny yeah uh, uh, so i love doing yeah i mean uh, you say uh, i just finished one and uh i love doing all of it yeah has there ever been a time with your body of work and your ability to really st you steal a lot of scenes in your films and tv shows where the the top build star if someone been like man like you've you kind of put them on edge because the reason i ask is because when I had William Sanderson on the show, we were talking about Lonesome Dove, and he was like his character, he played this awesome character, but Tommy Lee Jones' build is the top thing. The director approached William Sanderson and says, hey, like, I know you guys are friends, but like maybe don't do a good job because you're kind of taken away from Tommy because people are going to resonate with your character more. Has that ever happened to you where you're kind of like been tell told to like, hey, like you you did a great job, but you got to remember the, the fans are coming here for the name of the marquee here. Well, first of all, it's it's pointless if you're in a scene with William Sanderson to try and steal anything from William <laughs> yeah. Sanderson. No, that guy's an icon. It's pointless. <laughs> and uh, so the best way to do it is if I were a uh, higher billing than William Sanderson and he was in the scene, I'm just turning it over. Right. So that's the way to go with that. And and the otherwise, no, I don't know. Uh, um, no, because I try to accommodate, you know, if it's somebody else's scene, there's a good example for this. If it's somebody else's scene, it's your job uh, to to turn the scene over. However, if here's what's difficult. Here's what a good actor does. I was in a movie called Compote. Yep. And um, the scene was written. So actually the, war, the warden is sitting above Philip Seymour Hoffman. And the scene's actually... I'm not in the movie very much, but it's the Warren scene. It's the warden scene. Phil Hoffman, who ended up getting an Oscar for that movie, completely turned the scene over to me because I don't know. I guess he trusted me. I'm getting emotional now because yeah. we missed Phil Hoffman. Uh, uh, and and of course the scene works because it, it's the, the fucking warden, you know, excuse my language. No, it's also the scene they show, they showed that year for like awards and stuff like that, where it's, it's like here, this guy's with the Academy Award, but who is also in that scene? It's, it's you. It's, it's pretty cool about that. And, you know, and, and f the scene doesn't work if Phil's in there trying to, you know, trying to be Phil, you, you know, in other words, Phil, let me be the warden. Right. That, that's what I, that, that's what a really good actor does. They don't. Yeah, they don't right. Have... The one of the other things with your career, I know we've talked about but Starship Troopers. At the time, you watch it as a kid because it's like humans versus aliens. It's violent. It's got one liners. There's nudity. There's swearing. There's drinking. But as you get older, the social commentary and the awareness of that film. I mean, Paul, his whole career from Road Wolf Cop and to that. I mean, just prolific as well. But when you're reading a script like that, are you looking at it as like I, how I've watched the first time where it's like, hey, I'm a general, I'm a so soldier fighting aliens on a distant planet, save the galaxy. Or do you look at the script and realize what they're trying to say in, this, in, the, in the lines and in the film? 
Well, okay. So I read the Heinemann's book, you know, yep. and uh, it's pretty, cl pretty close. Yeah. I mean, it's not as, uh, uh, it's not as funny. I mean, right. because, you know, Paul's got <laughs> this evil wit. And dark whatever. humor. Yes. Dark. Yeah. But way dark. <laughs> dark. But, <laughs> but uh, Paul's one of our really, to me, great filmmakers. I mean, he made the best movie about World War II ever made for me. Yep. And uh, so, uh, 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 and plus, that acting that was done, he, every everything you've ever seen in any of his movies, even if you don't like them, including Showgirls, that's Paul's choice. Yes, Paul didn't make any mistakes and flub up anything. He chose all that. Yeah. So sometimes he gets it. You know, sometimes the world doesn't really stay with him on some of this stuff, and he in fact does stuff in movies that almost sabotage the movie, and and, and sometimes it doesn't. Like Quato and in, in normal, you know, popping out. It grossed my wife out. She loves Paul, but you know, and uh, you know, it's risky. He takes risks. Uh, 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 but you know, in the in the in the in the grasshopper uh, uh, smashing me scene. Uh, well, anyway, I kind of lost my train of thought. But you know, it was just all you, you had to know what was going on, right? Well, what was get... going on was what he did. And that movie's so great. It's a seamless yes. CGI movie, by the way. It's, it's one of the great CGI yes. movies. It's to, it was really cool, too. It's like you have someone like you, Michael Ironside, Clancy Brown. You have all of like these hard-nosed, like, veteran actors having a blast in a film where there's bugs killing people. It's just it's just because it looks like you guys are all so happy. It's, just, it's always so good to see, like, the reviews, like, all the re-releases all these years later where it's like, this movie is such a good movie. Well, it it actually aftermarket is what made it such a big movie. Uh, now it's got you know I go to conventions to sign stuff. Oh yeah, There's Starship Trooper police running around and everything, and uh, it, it was the uh, it didn't really kill it at the box office, but it 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 uh, uh, it's been a, an icon of a movie. Yeah, and, well, it, it set some trends. Too, yes, so. you mentioned the vagrant and your kind of cool idea there, but is there another character you've always wanted to revisit if given a limited budget? And if you had full control over the production of it? Well, I don't want control over it. I mean, I'm, I'm okay with all that. I, I want somebody good. Okay. I've worked for such well, hardcore people that I want them to have control of it. I don't right. want to have control over them. I don't want to get any fights with any of those people. <laughs> but, uh, I, yeah, I, uh, uh, I would have liked to have known a little more about Webster. Yeah. Yep. You know, I would have liked to have had a, Maybe a back background movie about Webster. Yeah. Well, it's a character too. I think what makes that character so great is that you're he's a tough guy and he's a hitman. But what if he's this way because his wife died or he lost his kid to a drug driver? It's like that little stuff there where it's like I never know watching those movies why certain people act the way they do, but I always try to create this thing where it's like, I want to get sympathetic with the bad guy here. And well, for some you know, I'm watching Blacklist, I'm binging on Blacklist now, and of course uh, uh, uh great show. He's he's a he's a old. I mean, I haven't seen him for a while because, but he's he's a f old friend of mine, and you know when he was starting, I was starting. I mean, he he's younger than I am, but you know I started late. So, uh, I, I I like to think I I watch it and I get such a kick out of it because I think that might be what happened to Webster, <laughs> yeah. you know, <laughs> that kind of thing. You uh. You talked about your wife and the importance she has in your career, but when it comes to for having a, especially in your industry, marriage these days, for you to be as married as long as you have, how important is it to have that type of like community or circle around you that helps you be conducive and be successful? And when you have your bad days, they're there to pick you up and vice versa. You know, it's in, it, you can't even, you know, there's no way to describe it. You know, not only that, I, I you know, I, she has this team that she works with and, you know, I call them my harem, you know, they're, <laughs> they're all in there and they, and she gets them over and they're from, they're, Ital they're Italian and everything. And, and, uh, they even jump in and make me feel better about myself. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's just invaluable. It's, uh, especially lately, you see a lot of tragedy in your industry, I mean, there's tragedy all over the world right now, but 
it's it is interesting when you see people that were suffering or they could have beat like a drug abuse or just it's just it's just sad when people just can't find the people around them or even the people around them aren't noticing that they need help or they're willing to reach out but they don't it's like it's just a very sad thing and it's like what advice do you have for an actor that's or an actress that's jumping in there now that's maybe in that position where it's like i'm not getting a role i'm starting to drink more you know what i like, tell kids when the, I, I visit acting classes as i say don't party and they go well, yeah. what and i said just don't party i mean if you want to party party after you get that big job and then you can afford the rehab damn but uh you know really it isn't about it's 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 not about that it's you know yeah. uh i I had to take steps to deal with all that. And I did. And, uh, that was, and most of the people I kind of hang out with now, uh, uh, they're plenty. There's a lot yeah. of it, unfortunately. And, uh, I hang out with them and there's some I, very high profile ones who are very proudly have done a lot of good for a lot of people. So yeah. it's good to be done out there. It's, uh, for those two years when the pandemic happened and I don't like dating these episodes because that's okay. Uh, but in your in your field, was there ever a moment in those two years, like the first six months or first year, where it's like, "Oh shit, I can't do what I love to do. Maybe I can only do commercials from now on, or maybe I can only do voice acting from now on." Like, was there ever a fear in your eyes where it's like, "Maybe I no, you else? know what?" I, I, during the very height of the pandemic, I got called by those guys who produced Outer Banks, and I, the, you know, yeah, yeah. <laughs> in the the huge throes of a COVID, I was flown down to our Barbados and Charleston uh, in the middle of the whole, I mean, 19, uh, 2020. And then, uh, 2021, I was in uh, our Barbados, uh, locked in my room for five days. We just, I worked. It's awesome. Is there, I know you mentioned obviously the where movie you just did, but what's also on your radar the coming couple, couple of couple years, couple of months and stuff like that. You know, uh, I'm going to go down really just and be, uh, Milena's not, she's from Rome and she's going to be in Atlanta a long time. And I'm not sure she's going to want to be, <laughs> I better be there, you know? So yeah. I'll be hanging out with all those people down there. And if they asked me to do something, I would do it. It's Even if uh, it was to be an extra, I would do it. So, right. Now, do you, have you mentioned you had a long-term relationship with an agent? How important is it to have kind of have those same people? Like, is it, how often do actors or people change agents or PRs and stuff like that? Is, it, is that something that's part of your life where it's like he's always that that's that very central, very controlled environment where you've had to save people around you your whole time? Well, a lot of people change, but, but I don't change. I never change anything. So what happened was this agent, Eileen Feldman, uh, uh, stopped being an agent. And so uh, uh, I, she changed. I didn't change. And uh, 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 I have a commercial agent who I've been with since I've ever had a commercial agent. And I mean, <laughs> I, I, this, they're the greatest people in, in my Hollywood life. And uh, I wouldn't, I have no need to change it. Right. I, I, uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not, I can't answer that question. Cause I just don't, I've had really good representation. No, it's great. It's again, it's super important to have that. Would you, to go back to the commercial thing, the other day I saw a commercial with William Devine uh, about some gold thing. And I kind of oh, laughed yeah. and I'm just like, man, this guy is such a great actor. And I'm like, it, like you kind of touched on it. You said, well, it's like this, this is still acting. And I read somewhere where someone asked him, like, hey, you're going to get back into TV and build movies or whatever. And he's like, well, I still do that because the commercial thing he goes, I get a script. I get this. I get this thing, and it's a, I play a character, a version of myself, talking about gold. It was, it, it was a very cool way of him saying, you know what, I still love acting, and this is a form of acting. It's, I think sometimes people see those commercials outside of like the big mega production ones for like the Super Bowl and stuff like that, where they're like, oh, this is we're just throwing money to get guest stars. But some of the best commercials I've seen, like that, uh, a couple of years ago before the pandemic, they had that Wrigley Spearmint Gum ad where the people writing love notes inside the gum wrappers. And as they got older, they gave it to their kids. And it's like, for a minute and a half, I'm glued to my TV. I don't care if this show or movie I was watching comes on. I want to know how this commercial ends. It's for you to get to be part of that world and kind of break down what goes into commercials. It's just a whole, it's pretty amazing. You know, uh, I, I've been fortunate in that these commercials I've been in have all been kind of like state of the art. You know, I mean, I get to be in this, 
Audi commercial where it's just my face. Yep. And it's just on forever. And uh I love it and myself. And so uh <laughs> I I uh I just got the one I worked on where four days was Matthew McGonaghy and it was just a big orchestra, a huge, like a you know, huge. <laughs> and so uh, you know, they're not they're fun. Yep. I mean, the whole acting process and everything is fun. And these cameras now, uh, and particularly there, their technology is maybe better a lot of times. In this case, certainly is good. And these these uh, uh, new cameras that aren't film, you know, what do you call, uh, you know, video cameras right. is essentially what they are. You know, you, you can't, uh, you can't do anything you, you know if it, if if he says make it small boy you better make it you better know how to make it small and that's acting you may uh, you better make it small and uh and th th those challenges are, are are really fun with some of your pedigree and background and history do you still feel you have to touch up on your acting skills at all or is that something that you just kind of you just obviously there's preparation that goes into a new role and stuff but how often do you have to feel like maybe you go to a acting coach or something like that, or just kind of look at the mirror? Type uh, see, the way I deal with that is, uh, since I was a kid, I always uh, acted out stuff. Gotcha. You know, I would be, uh, in uh, my, I was, uh, my, I have a half brother, but he was gone. So I essentially was like an only child. So I had to act out various roles and I did a lot of that. Love it. I mean, it really, you know, people came into my room, heard me talking to myself, think I was a weirdo. <laughs> so uh, I still do that. I, I still kind of imagine, I mean, I've got a big spacious room here, like a loft almost. <laughs> and uh, I, I don't draw, I don't lose my, um, you know, my uh, acting practice thing on my own. And like, for instance, if I'm watching somebody back to Jimmy Spader yep. or Robert Downey, for that matter, or Montgomery Cliff, and they do something, I plagiarize it. You know, I just copy it. It isn't them that's doing it. It's me. Right. So it isn't going to be, it's going to be me doing it. Yep. And, and that's how I kind of do it. But I kind of keep my mind constantly in a learning situation about all that i'm right. aware of it. Well, it's cool because sometimes i've had some of the uh more of the action type people uh on the podcast with the firearms like the hand-to-hand -hand combat stuff and when they watch a current show with police or swat or active shooter type stuff they're always very like this is not possible or this is how you hold the gun or this is the type of thing so it's kind of cool to see you kind of feel like where it's like you pull more out of that you're not really there to critique other people's acting or productions but you're there to kind of pull out what works and what thing you think is going to work for you right and and speaking of firearms i don't I, I don't i leave that up to the this is the thing you know the people there's supposed to be lots and lots and lots of people there who are supposed Experts. to be taking care of that right. you're a tool grab the damn thing open it, check it, see if there's a hole in the barrel and there's light at the under end of it and then get busy. Right. You know? And then somebody will come and say, well, I wish you wouldn't hold it with two hands and then just don't hold it with two hands. You right. Know what I mean? Right. Yeah. It's crazy. Cause your industry, the last, the whole rust thing, and I, I know it's settled or they, whatever. It's just you, the amount of work that the people, whether it's armor or craft services, the amount of people involved in their production and how much trust you have to have on each other, in every department to be working on the same page. It's just, it's, I guess it's kind of, I never had to, I mean, I, obviously I assumed it's a lot of people, but when you look at the nitty gritty of that stuff from small productions compared to big productions, sometimes jobs get disregarded or overlooked. And it's just, it's fascinating to me where the productions that are super small are making sure they still do everything that's supposed to be done. Well, the thing about it, I just shot the werewolf movie in New York state. They don't allow you to have a real, uh, uh, right. They have and there's really no point in terms of the way these cameras work now. There's no point in having a real weapon unless you're going to do close-ups on it. And, you know, like they do in uh, in Blacklist, you know, they're doing yes. 
that you can't imagine how much specialty special work goes on with that. And as far as Russ's concerned, there's only one answer to that. And they're still not, uh, as far as I'm concerned, getting to the bottom. Where did the live round come from? Tell me that. And then let's get on with the rest of it. I don't want to know anything about out. I don't want to know anything about Sander Baldwin. I don't want to know anything about anything. I want to know about the right. live round and then let's move on from there. Right. Nobody's dealing with that. No, Where did it, it come from? And it could happen again. That's the, I think that's for me. It's just like, this, if this has happened on this, it could happen in another production. It could happen in Star Wars. It could happen in whatever. It's like, it, well, there's it's, not, it won't. They're not going to, there's going to be a live round with it. It's Star, Star Wars. There won't be a live round within a mile of that set. Right. If the live rounds, no live rounds d- should be around anything like that. Yeah, it's crazy. And, uh, uh, you know, and, and there's no live round on Blacklist, which shoots. I mean, I've never seen so much b- b- shooting <laughs> in my life. <laughs> yeah. and, and, and there's not a live round within five miles of that. Right. Yeah, safety. The blanks are bad enough. Right. You know, uh, that's how that uh, Brandon, Brandon Lee, Lee, right? Yep. Yeah, there was a that was a bad, bad accident. There was a a blank that threw the projectile that was stuck in the barrel. This is why <clears throat> I like revolvers because you can open them up and see, see the inside. light at the end of it. You know, you can do it with an automatic too, but you know, right. just make sure there's light at the end of the barrel. That's all. Right. Well. This has been awesome, Marshall. Uh, thank you. I for hope your... I didn't go on about. No, I, I, I love the passion of it. I wish more people th- felt the same way you do about that. And uh, I wish you all the success on your current work. I can't wait to check out this werewolf movie. I'm a huge fan of werewolves myself. And, oh, uh, blackout. Blackout. Once Just it comes out, it, hope it gets to a place where you can see it. That's the number one thing you need to do, and then, and then see it. Yeah. Well, I'll, uh, I'll check it out. And uh, again, stay safe. Thank you for all this and uh, keep acting because it's uh, refreshing to see you still popping up there today. Well, it's great to have you do this and this is fun. So awesome. uh, uh, I guess we're, I guess I'm going to leave you now. Is that yeah. right? Yes, sir. We're all good to go. Peace out. Oh, hello. I'm just enjoying this nice fucking candle. Anyways, I'm John, the host of Spirit Talk, and I want to talk to you about nice fucking candles. We are lucky to have Nice Fucking Candles as a sponsor of the podcast. And if you use code SPEARTALK15, you get 15% off your first order. Or use the affiliate link below to always get your candle needs through Nice Fucking Candles. Nice Fucking Candles are 100% soy wax. They have a 65-hour burn time, maybe more, if you uh, nurse the flame a little bit. Maybe, I don't know, I'm not an expert on flames uh, or candles. But I will say, these things burn a long fucking time. You ask me about the wick. It's a double wick for even burning, which is amazing. And uh, they come in three incredible flavors. Uh, I'm not sure if you're going to be eating these candles, but if you do like them, the scents are eucalyptus and ginseng, tobacco and fireside, and seaside and driftwood. Once again, uh, nice fucking candles. They are the candle company for Spear Talk. And if you love candles and need a good scent to clear out your office, your room, your podcast room, your weight room, uh, your whatever you're doing in a room that smells like crap, use this candle. It's amazing. Thank you. Check them out. Love nice fucking candles.